Promotional support provided by Edible Jersey, a quarterly magazine and online publication celebrating the local food of the Garden State for 15 years. Learn more at ediblejersey.com. Hey everyone, I'm Buki Lake Bidet, host, journalist, son of immigrants, and part-time baker. Every dish has a story, and those stories are rooted in heritage and tradition. That's what I'm hungry for. I'm taking you guys across New Jersey, one of the most diverse states in the country, to meet the people and hear the stories to get to what we've always known, that there's always room at the table. This is Table for All. Lead me down to the river. This country would not exist without black people. And it's no exaggeration to say there would be no New Jersey without black people. When America was formed, we were here. We fought in the Revolutionary War. Even when forced through the hell of slavery, the culture, the food, the resilience and vibrancy has persevered and made New Jersey, my home, what it is today. Macedonia AME Church. Established in 1832 is Camden's first Black-owned church. And Connie Jackson, a proud Camdenite, historian and choir member, or as I call her, The Voice, is here to teach me more about its incredible history. We'll take it on the road. We'll take it on the road. And here we are at Macedonia AME, one of the stops. Can you tell me a little bit about what this church means to this particular neighborhood? Absolutely. This was a church, but this was the meeting house. This was the schoolhouse. This is where things happened, right here mm -hmm. at Macedonia Amy Church. Black right. men built this church. Brick by brick. Brick by brick. New Jersey has a sordid history when it comes to slavery. Even though slavery was technically abolished in 1804, back channel laws made it so that some African Americans were enslaved until 1865. When New Jersey finally did abolish slavery, it meant that newly freed men and women could make a fresh start. They bought land from Quakers and abolitionists, and on that land, they formed communities that are still predominantly black today. The result, places built by and for black people. I feel like church plays a huge role in the black community. It does. Think about it. When we say church, people immediately think about a physical building, but it's actually their faith mm -hmm. that kept them going, that kept them strong, that kept them thriving. And when the Fugitive Slave Act was passed in 1850, requiring that slaves be returned to their owners even once they were in a free state, the Camden community stepped up. There was a story that was told, and a true story. There were uh, some slave owners that were bringing the slave um, up here from the south to the north, horse and buggy. They got right in front of the church, and the slaves started howling and screaming for help. They came out of the church, rescued him, and the white men that were in that horse and buggy uh, <laughs> became afraid, which they should have been. When a group of black people were coming up out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and they ran. <laughs> and the man was saved. Camden was not the destination, it was just a stop to where. Right. Well, once they got here and they saw what was here, it's not farmland right now, but then, you know, it was. So what you saw was opportunity that but would I, make you want to stay, true. say, okay, you know what? Yeah, we were going to New York, <laughs> <laughs> but we're staying here in Camden. Mm -hmm. Passengers on the Underground Railroad were often young, able-bodied men who spent their lives working as slaves to build the South from the ground up. And when they arrived in Camden, they finally saw the opportunity to build something of their own. I would be <laughs> terrified. Strange lands, you have no idea, it's just empty fields, mm -hmm. and they saw promise, they saw mm -hmm. what it could be. Being enslaved, being down South, when you arrive in somewhere that it looks like there's some possibility, of being able to do something and being able to be greeted by other blacks who would take you in, then, you know, that becomes home. And cementing the ties to Camden's proud black history has never been more important today. After decades of high crime rates, white flight, and still a reputation as one of the most dangerous cities in America, Camden is bouncing back. Half a billion dollars have been invested in recent years to revitalize Camden's waterfront and bring big industries back to Camden. But Ms. Connie and others worried that this could price Black Camdenites out. I think that it's 
critical for us as African Americans to tell our history about the land and how it was developed and how we had African Americans that own the land, that built the houses and the churches. And then to recognize it, we need to have, you know, historical markers to be able to help tell that story. And, and you're and on then a path to, to, to have a marker for this. Absolutely. I think that um, Camden now is, is thriving, but it's important that we have a stake mm -hmm. in the development, that we have a stake in the direction that it goes and how it thrives. We built this country. We built this country. And if we built this country, then we absolutely should be a part of rebuilding and bringing our city back. There's no doubt that black culture has made the city of Camden what it is today. And a huge part of how that culture is shared is through food. After all, where do people go after church on Sunday? If you live in Camden, you already know the answer. Corinne's Place has been a Camden institution for over 30 years, and now it's getting famous famous. In 2022, the Soul Food Restaurant was named a James Beard America's Classic. James Beard is basically the Oscars of food. And since then, they've been churning out as many orders of mac and cheese, collard greens, Cajun turkey wings, and fried chicken as they can manage. It's the kind of black Americana cuisine that was born during slavery and came to Camden alongside passengers on the Underground Railroad. I had to get there early to beat the rush, but before I could meet the one and only Miss Corinne, I was put to work by her niece, Monica. We're about to dip up some of this cobbler and package it for, for sale. You want to grab that for you? OK. Oh. Mm. Right to my car, right? Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, where did everyone learn to bake so well? Um, grandma. Grandma. Grandma did cobblers, all the pies, and she just um, it shifted down to the younger generation. So what is what is the ratio Um, crust, crust to she apple? Wants, she wants to, crust along with the apple, and then if there's too much apple, then you dip up a little more crust. Okay. You know, because some people want just crust. Oh, I love can't. crust. So do I. And then I'm seeing, too, that there's also crust on the bottom. Yes. Which it has to be crust on the bottom. Because some people, no crust on the bottom. They mm -hmm. want to do little, mm -hmm. little something on the top, and it's not gonna. That's not it. You need the crust. You need that 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 rich deliciousness. Yeah, that Nobody's ratio. eating cobbler for for, for fruit. No. Grandma will be proud of you. You dipping up this cobbler so like a pro. I, I try to honor grandmas <laughs> all across America with yes. this. Yes. You left the crust. I will specifically yeah. left some crust for us <laughs> because Grandma would want it that grandma way. Grandma would want it you that gotta, way. You gotta taste you gotta the, the food. Crust. Cheers. That crust. The crust. That's a secret. But that cinnamon sugar on top. Very mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. This is delicious. Have at it. And I'm not going to stop. And the bottom was mm -hmm. perfect. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. You're this welcome. is really good. You're welcome. And now we have we have now stuff we prepared have... for everybody. Yep. So I think I, I work for my meal. I'm good. Yes, you have. That's good. I'm mm -hmm. good. I'm Thank going to put you. that 10 pounds back on you. No. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make me gain this COVID weight back. <laughs> And now the moment I've been waiting for. It's time to meet the well-dressed, the fierce, the legend herself. Drum roll, please. Now introducing Camden's de facto grandma and the namesake herself, Miss Corinne. You hear that, you know, nothing good comes out of Camden. I beg your pardon. How did this all come about, this, uh, this James Beard Award? Because we, you had no idea. Someone texts me that congratulations on your James Beard Award. And I'm looking at the text, I said, who is James Beard? I know James Brady, that's my <laughs> grandfather. You know, then I call my daughter, and my daughter and my grand, they don't get excited over nothing. You know, okay, well, whatever, you know, like that. But when they looked it up, they started crying. So I said, what? <laughs> they bring tears to your eyes? I said, oh, wow. God is good to, to bring this to me. I must have been doing something halfway right. You, you never perfect. got into it. 
for well, the awards. My award is just as long as I take care of my people. Because you started as a, a social used, worker. Yeah, I used to be a counselor, a juvenile mm -hmm. counselor, and that was my passion. And cooking was, uh, I would unwind cooking after mm -hmm. trying to save the world. <laughs> and that's what I thought I was going to be able to do, but you know, you can't save everybody. Oh, but Miss Corinne's been saving more lives than she can count. She's known for hiring young people from the community, people who may need a second chance or even a first to get their lives on track. She's even created a scholarship program and holds regular fundraisers to help people pay for college tuitions. But as good as all that feels, it's nothing compared to the food. <laughs> Thank you, Monica. You're welcome. This looks so good. What's this? That's a oh, Cajun that's turkey wings. wings. I call myself a gourmet soul food cook. I work hard for this reputation. You know, being a black person, you got to be a super black. You just can't be a, a average right. black. Twice as much. I got to do twice as much. Uh, yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. You got to get more, get less. <laughs> you know what I'm talking oh, about. Do you know what business I'm in? Yes, I know. No. And so <laughs> I, I didn't want to be, so I had to excel in what I did. Um, can we have a moment to discuss this chicken? Good. It's tender, flavorful all throughout, and I, I understand why that critic likes this chicken so yeah, much. It's did. very, very good. When you're cooking this food, when you're eating this food, mm -hmm. what do you what do you feel? Do you think about your your own mom and uh, cooking in the kitchen? She was a church lady, and all they did was dress and eat. Oh, dress and eat. Dress oh, and yeah. eat. Oh yeah, Sunday Sunday was people. an affair. You better believe it. My mother would start on Saturday cooking for Sunday, and we always had a poetry, a pork, and a beef every Sunday. That's what we would eat. Wow. So that's how I know how to eat. I, I don't know about no TV dinners and all that stuff. <laughs> I know about the no, real. No hungry man? The real deal. No, no, no. And her customers agree. After eating at Corinne's, you're all smiles. Yo, this is some good chicken. If you can close your eyes and eat a piece of chicken, you, mm -hmm. and you know you're eating chicken, you're eating some good chicken. And that's what you get here. If you want good cooking, good soul food, this is the spot. Now that's soul food. Emphasis on the soul. Miss Corinne works hard to create that community atmosphere. I walk through the buffet and I talk, have dialogue with different families. And so I'm sure every last one of us has been to place. Everybody has a cell phone. The baby has a cell phone. Grandma <laughs> got a cell phone. So I told him, I said, that's not allowed here. Your family, you got to sit and talk to your family. If we would read the Bible the way we <laughs> on our cell phone, we wouldn't be, they wouldn't be on their way to hell. You know what I'm saying? That's the truth. I, am I telling the truth? It's not just a restaurant. Because a normal restaurant, they don't care. You can be on your phone, let the nah, baby be on the phone. Nah, Who cares? Nah, but to be here and to really not just embrace community, but sort of instill it yeah. and require it yeah. is something, they something special. They appreciate that. Corinne has been here for a while, so she has helped out this community greatly. You have our food? Everybody going to be around here singing Kumbaya. But I have to say, what's getting everybody to shout hallelujah and thank you, Jesus, is Miss Corinne's Cajun turkey wings. Cameron was telling me that that there's a secret to the turkey wings. Oh, and yeah. he said, he's, yeah, I have to ask you. Because he don't know. Oh. That's why. OK. <laughs> and you want to live long? I do. Okay. Well, you didn't get the secret. Oh, OK. <laughs> Do you see how that fall? Do you see yeah, how that? Yeah, really it's falling. I falling. mean, that's how it's supposed to be. You can't, turkey, it's not supposed to be tough. You're supposed to take, you know, just fall apart. That's the one. That's the one right there. That's it's really it. good. Perfectly you seasoned. Taste the spice? Yeah, I taste the spice. Very, very good. Thank you. Do you find that it's going to be hard to spread this out and follow these traditions as we go down generations? You should, we, should, we should never lose this. You should never lose the flavor or the, you know, we can't do that. This is a part of life. This is a part of living, mm -hmm. you know. This is a part of happiness. Mm -hmm. Don't you feel happy now? I, I feel warm and fuzzy. Mm -hmm. I feel great. I feel excellent. For as unique and one of a kind as Miss Corinne is, and she truly is one in a million, she's merely following in the footsteps of other black foodies who did exactly the same thing over 200 years ago, create a community through food. There's more to black cuisine than fried chicken and collard greens. The OG black food philanthropist in New Jersey had a different specialty. I was surprised too, oysters. This looks beautiful. 
Do you guys know that oysters used to be the size of a lady's hand? So these tiny little things are yeah, not they, it. <laughs> they would have been like, um, excuse me. <laughs> 85 miles and a change of clothes later, and I'm in Jersey City with Noelle Lorraine Williams, the director of the African American History Program at the New Jersey Historical Commission. She's one of the only people I know who's dug up this fascinating history about New Jersey's black oystermen in the 1800s. Mmm. That was really good. When we think of food of the African American community, we think chitlins, we think fried chicken, we think okra, we think all those different things, but who would have thought that oysters mm. were a part of our culture? So you have the shore, you have the Hudson, Newark, you have the Passaic, all of these like bodies of water. So oysters are a part of the black experience here. And then there were actually prominent black oyster farmers in these parts. Yes. So we have the Jacksons, who were only just a couple of miles away from here in Jersey City. And then we go even as far as Essex County to Newark. We have the O'Fake family. And he created his own kind of like oyster stand right there on Broad and Market. But all of these communities were all connected. And that's what I find to be really fascinating. These families had a stronghold on the food and culture scene in the 19th century, hugely popular among white and black clientele alike, and they used their success to give back. They were raising money. They were having speakers, like Frederick Douglass came to Newark, Henry Garnett came to Newark, James McCune, all of these famous black abolitionist figures, and it just brings to life the different ways that um, African Americans were fighting for freedom. It seems like there was a real thirst or zest for community back then. Do you still think that community exists today in the, with the African American population now? We have to understand how complicated African American life was. For them, it was about blood, it was about family, it was about community because they literally were always having their family and the connections broken. In order to create African America or to create being black, what you had to do was imagine community. And we're still imagining community. There's a term African Americans use. It's like a play brother or a play sister mm -hmm. or a play, play cousin. And that I believe stems from um, enslavement and black free folks just working to create community in places like here in Jersey City and Newark and Camden. Every marginalized group says, you know, we've come far, but we've got a <laughs> long way to go. How much farther do we have to go? One of the rallying cries of a democracy is that everyone has the right to their own power, their own body, to all of the individuals we mentioned today. All of these people could have easily taken their wealth and moved somewhere else, but they stayed with their people, the poorer folks who still lived here in New Jersey. And I think it's important for people to understand that African Americans have always been courageous, have always been bold, and have always tried to keep community in the face of um, a society that just challenged being fully human. Hundreds of years later, and the struggle to keep our community intact is still being tested today. Welcome to Lawnside, the very first Black-owned and run town in the state. Think of it as once New Jersey's Black Wall Street. It used to be called Freehaven, and that's truly what it's been to Black people since 1804. And it remains one of the few boroughs in the entire United States that has had a predominantly African-American population throughout its existence. But its future? Its future is in danger. I'm outside the Peter Mott House, an iconic Underground Railroad stop because it's one of the very few stops owned by a person of color. I'm here to meet 96-year-old revolutionary Ida Conway. She's been fighting for black ownership for decades. Mother Lawnside, <laughs> as, as you are known to everyone around here. Tell me about some of your efforts. I know that you have been protesting them building warehouses and different things like that. Would you put a, a, a warehouse in the middle of Haddonfield, but a neighborhood that's poor or black, they just say, whatever I do to your town, 
It's an improvement. Business is booming in and around the one square mile town, but it's not black business. Big corporations are buying up land and tearing down essential community assets, threatening to displace people like Ida, one of the few people left here who remember what Lawnside used to be and its place in black and New Jersey's history. Where do you want to see Lawnside go in the next generation? The things that I'd like to see would be recreation center for the, the children, urgent care. I'd like to see the little parks, things that people can use in the town, but I would like them to own it themselves. Mm. How important is that ownership? Most important. Most important. You can say, this is my town. A place that has always had Black-owned and operated farms, schools, churches. All that history could soon be paved over. We were called Lawnside, but after a while, they were going to be called Asphalt. <laughs> <laughs> Would you ever, would you ever leave? No, I'm gonna stay here and fight. They'll have to carry me out. So do you see any young people in Lawnside kind of taking on this torch to rebuild? And they don't want to come back because they don't feel as though they have anything to come back to. So how do we get them back? I don't know, except to show that it's important to us and we want to hold on to it. Okay. And that they can join, uh, join the fight to hold on to it. Well, guess what, Ida? Young black people across New Jersey are joining the fight. These high schoolers staged a protest outside City Hall in Newark, demanding their school hire and support more black teachers to teach them about the very history Ida, Connie, Corinne, and Noel are trying to keep alive. You all deserve to feel safe in your classrooms. You all deserve to be safe in your city. You all deserve black educators that don't get pushed out of these systems. Y'all are that class 2022 is dead. If the civil rights movement and Black Lives Matter taught us anything, it's that there's more than one way to fight. And that brings us to our final stop and looking forward to what lies ahead for the black community. Someone who's really changing history and setting a new example for the next generation is Charlotte Nebris. This incredible 14-year-old dared to imagine her own limitless potential, and at age 11, became the first Black Marie in the New York City Ballet's Nutcracker. The show has been going on for so long, and it's crazy that that had never happened yet. Almost 50 years later, it took. It's definitely just such a unique experience that I'm so, so lucky to have had. So I joined her at the bar to learn a thing or two from the next generation on how they're breaking down barriers. Oh, you can start oh, out with oh, a little oh, that bar. Was, that was really graceful. And then you bring it in and you stretch <laughs> forward to your leg. I can't do it. I can't do it, Charlotte. You can go towards your leg again. Oh, Charlotte. Oh, Charlotte. Okay. <laughs> you can take your leg off the bar now. Okay. How are, they, how are these hands? Yeah, normally we start out like this, so it's a little bit easier. The younger kids do that, and then it slowly <laughs> turns into this. I'm gonna but... be one of the younger kids today. All right, can you teach me a spin? I can't leave here without knowing how to spin. Sure. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let's see if I can do this. So we go to the side. Side. And then in. And in. And then spot your head. <laughs> I think that's as good as I'm gonna get it. But I made it a full rotation, so I'm feeling yeah. good. And oh yeah, she wrote a book about it. Now, this came out when you were 12. Do you wanna know what I was doing at 12? <laughs> it was not writing a book. When I was performing in the Nutcracker, I would see these kids, and I'm sure that they probably saw themselves in me like I did when I was little. And it was really like a full circle moment because when I was little, I went to see Swan Lake and it was Misty Copeland was performing as her debut as the Swan. And that was a really formative moment for me. So getting to sort of be that person for another little kid, it was just so surreal. Do you think if you didn't see Misty and Swan Lake that maybe this being Marie in the Nutcracker might not have happened. I definitely do think that that was important for me. And it's true that representation matters. And if you can see it, that's what I like to say. If you can see it, you can be it. It is the most important thing you can do, especially for kids, to just have the mindset that you can do anything and there shouldn't be anything telling them not to. And I know uh, your, your grandfather got a shout out in here. He was making... They had uh, the cooking. 
that we do as a family. And so that that's me. I was baking there. Mm. That's a really big part of, um, you know, at Charlotte at home, we our culture comes out with food and, you know, especially at the holidays. Well, mom, I mean, you, you know the barriers that African-Americans face. And I know that you said you didn't want to kind of put that on your kids. How did you raise such incredible individuals? I certainly raised them to be aware of themselves and the world we exist in, but I didn't want them to feel pressured or burdened by that because I do feel we're in a different time. The opportunities are there. This was a way for us to share it and say, this happened, you can, you can see what it was about. You can feel it through the imagery, the words, and then maybe be inspired to come to that theater. Our whole goal was to be able to share diverse stories and not only showcase the struggle, but also to show joy because we're more than just suffering. We have happiness and joy and that definitely needs to be represented. How proud of this girl are you? Yeah, exceptionally proud. And that's been the biggest uh, gift of parenting that I didn't know that I was gonna receive is that you also grow with the kid. Being in the presence of these remarkable, gutsy, unrelenting, brilliant black women has opened my eyes to the magic that is the black experience. They've guided us from the history of the Underground Railroad in New Jersey and towards a brighter, promising, and more optimistic future. And when I grow up, I want to be just like Charlotte. He watches. He watches me. See? I'll do me all the time. Promotional support provided by Edible Jersey, a quarterly magazine and online publication celebrating the local food of the Garden State for 15 years. Learn more at ediblejersey.com.